Welcome to the Q Pod, episode eight. This is uh, our weekly pod. We unpack the latest stuff we're working. I'm in Amsterdam for Cube Con. Dave Vellante, my co-host. Dave, uh, <laughs> eight eight episodes. We said under ten was going to be our test run. Learning a lot, getting our groove swing down. Still feeling the vibes, but you know a lot of stuff going on. Great, uh, great to see you. How you doing? Yeah, John, awesome, great job in Amsterdam. You and Savannah and rob and the whole team it was really really you it was really good i was i was watching you know i was at click on tuesday we were broadcasting there from uh, click world which was kind of interesting you, you remember the early big data days remember we would have on click attunity talent right all three of those companies are coming together now so it was kind of like back to the future but uh really interesting i mean I, if you got time i'd love to <laughs> fill you in that's a big data renaissance dave it's all coming back circle full circle with ai and it's killer Killer uh, data surge. Oh, my God. So uh, Sanji Mohan was out here. I saw him. He's on a, on a panel. We had great, great sessions. Amazing attendance. Europe's back. I mean, steady state. 10,000 people at a European event. That means North America is going to be completely packed. But this is the weekly pod. This is the, the, the stuff. So much happening this week. Every week that we started this pod, this is our eighth episode. It seems like it's been crazy. AI madness is so much in the news. Just this week, we, you know, a lot of discussions around code pollution, um, chat GPT pumping out code into the system, um, uh, Stack Overflow charging for training data, BuzzFeed shuts down their news division, laying off um, everybody and another 120 people, insider, business insider, laying off 10% of the staff, complete media implosion. These are iconic brands that rode the tailwinds of the social networks. So ma major media implosion, digital. Me meanwhile, we're booming with video and we got AI story coming up. And of course, we, this is the Elon's, we joke every week, this is Elon's got a whole section of the bot today. We're going to go in, talk about Elon's stuff going in his world. He's got having a very interesting week dave spacex blows up it's blue friday check marks being re re removed everyone's freaking out he's trying to create a new firm to compete with open ai twitter drops him gets dropped by microsoft i mean stocks down i mean <laughs> he's losing billions uh we'll get into that so much was more. there um can i ask you a question was there i know you i saw you your interview with docker it was awesome but was there any chatter about docker because they were trying to charge for their free version and then they they did a pivot and they sort of decided not to for now was there any talk about that at kubecon no zero zero talk i mean i think they've been trying to do that but they have a freemium they're making tons of money on on paid subscriptions so they already have a very very successful subscription business so uh if they had any trial balloon it must have got blown out of the water really fast so yeah they definitely did a 180 on that but i wonder if that's permanent or just a little oops sorry anyway no, yeah, I mean, no they, talk about they, it though interesting they've been they've been, they've been uh, have over a year uh, on a steady state with their subscription business and they're over over 100 clearly rising past 100 million in revenue absolutely blowing away the numbers they're kicking ass docker is blowing away the numbers big time so you know i don't know if this this, this free version but that's not i haven't heard i haven't heard anything about charging yeah, a couple of weeks ago they maybe even a month ago they announced they were going to charge for the free version and then people went nuts and then they you know decided i think last week to say no we're not going to do that so no, anyway no. Yeah, didn't cool. hear about it. Yeah. No, no, no issue with DockerCon. Docker, Docker actually was not um, talked about much at KubeCon because KubeCon was kicking ass. The big story at KubeCon was platform engineering kind of becoming the new IT, and then WebAssembly or Wasm has getting traction. They just they now have support for all the major compilers for the browser. That means you don't have to rewrite JavaScript uh, code to get into JavaScript. So you know more developer you know productivity, enterprise hardening. So you know Docker was not in the fray at all from a from a news standpoint. I don't think they even had any news. You know what's funny, John, is I see from the ETR data, you know Kubernetes uh, momentum off the charts. It was like you know eighty percent net score with the ETR data. It dropped. You know it came down to sixty percent, but forty percent is high. There's 60 percent but you hear all this oh kubernetes blowback and you know people are disgruntled and but then it's it sounds like that's bullshit i mean ten thousand yeah. people show up and i mean it's rocking you say u.s is Any, anyone who says kubernetes is, is bullshit is, is doesn't know what they're talking about it's the hottest thing and it's and really it's going to continue to to be great uh as uh containers and kubernetes together uh, replace and start migrating off the old virtual machine model. There'll still be VMs, but that is a dominant architecture is going to be waning down and converting over to cloud native. So uh, pretty much a done deal at this point. So Kubernetes definitely has lift. Um, it's, it's hard to use, so it's on the simplicity side. It's not getting good scores, 
but it's getting good scores on on some of the other reliability and extensibility sides and scalability. So they're getting great great marks on that. The portability, they give themselves good scores, but they're the um, the critical analysis on the cube uh, from Rob Zdeche and the team was pretty much they could do some. They're not bad, but they're not they're not five stars. Um, they give them, we gave them I think a two or three two and a half star review on that one. But you know, simplicity still a problem. You know, and this, and this could be the only Achilles heel for Kubernetes, that Hadoop factor, I call it, where it's good, but it really is hard to use. But I think they're going to get through that. The other scores are pretty good. That's an opportunity for them to fill gaps. I mean, that's a, that's the way these things work in tech. Come up with something that's cool, that's game changing, and then people dig into it. Ah, oh, this is unbelievable. And then they say, wow, it's hard to secure. And boy, it doesn't really scale that well. And then all of a sudden the industry comes in and fixes the problem it, in a way that happened with big data, right? I mean, it got super complex and now look at, we could come out of the big data, you know, era, snowflake, data bricks, a whole ecosystem of governance, you know, companies, visualization companies, BI companies. And it, you know, took a while, but <laughs> it's rocking again. Yeah. I mean, I think we had a big conversation around data at KubeCon and this, is what came up in most of the conversation is that that infrastructure world, is not going to tolerate the chat GPT or AI stories because of it's just not hardened enough. You can't, there's so much protection around security and Kubernetes in this ecosystem around cloud native is making progress on enterprise grade capabilities. So what's happening is no one wants to even entertain this hype cycle of AI yet, but yet automation is key there. So they're very much like not thinking about it. And they're not even thinking about data because this market doesn't really think about data other than like log files or other kind of data, machine data. They're not really data. Data is not on their mind and it soon will be. And we kind of talked about that and that came up in, in, uh, in our discussions and people were agreeing with, um, you know, my take, which was, you know, that we're going to see a, a, a now a wave of code pollution. And what I mean by that is that in open source, anyone can contribute, whether it's a hackathon or whatever. And so with auto-generated um, coding, like you're seeing on ChatGPT, more code can be generated faster. So, you know, who's going to watch that code? So code pollution is going to be a problem. Richard Hartman, who runs the largest open source conference in Europe, um, he was on the Cube. Um, he's also on the governing board of CNCF. He believes code pollution is going to be a problem as well as licensing around that too. So, and, and by the way, in the United States, there's no case law against this yet. So if you auto generate anything out of a large language model, it cannot be copyright as far as the current law is. So if you do that, and it also has code that has Apache license or GPL or other license, it can be convoluted and it's a problem. So this is gonna be, we think that could be a real problem. That was the most of the conversation that was in the weeds, but it's very relevant. And the other problem with ChatGPT is that it's all public information. So um, a lot of people were talking about how they're putting stuff into ChatGPT, not knowing that it's used for public consumption. So these large language models have essentially such a wide corpus of data that you know the licensing and copyright infringement is a big concern. That, that was a conversation. And, and then it just continues to get more uh, nuance as things like Stack Overflow, a site that's known for developers, um, is charging for their questions for the, around the training data. So they have proprietary information. And so that was a big shock. So Redis doing the same thing. So you're starting to see in the large language models in, in the AI side, Dave, people are going to protect their IP, which is proprietary information. So well, code pollution and proprietary information is huge. Well, you saw, you know, Samsung, right? The guys put up you know, the information in chat GPT, not knowing exactly what you just said, that now it's I don't know, owned by chat GPT or can be, help train the models. And so that's weird. You know, the hard part, I think, I mean, this is where the government is trying to figure it out, but they're in no position to figure it out. It's like, okay, so when I write, I can write anything I want on a WordPress blog, right? I can write damaging information. I can write biased information, unethical, you know, information. I can disseminate, you know, fake news. But, you know, WordPress isn't responsible for that. But this is different because it's like the system is generating results. But like, what if Google, what if a Google search brings up some, you know, fake news and then that gets distributed? Is Google search responsible for that? So the, the difference now is it just happens so much faster and it's just so much more powerful. So, but, but at the end of the day, is the platform responsible well, that's, 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 that's you're, you're, you're conflating two things, right? So first of all, Google's not 
giving you and creating information for you. They're not auto-generating content. They're giving you a navigation redirection. So if you go on WordPress and do a blog about misinformation, yeah, Google will search it and they'll index it. Um, if someone clicks on it, Google's not obliged to just to give notification on. They're not saying this is content. There, it's a it's a user experience that's known as a re, as a as an experience. It's someone else's information. Google's not viewed on that. And yeah, but they might be promoting it. They might be putting it into the top ten results. Are they, I mean, is that really conflating? I mean, is it kind of a gray area, isn't it? If 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 there's fake news. And Google saying, yeah, but, I, hey, but I don't, I don't turn around and say, I don't turn around and say these Google results are the answer to a question and put it off as information. That's stealing. That's called copyright. So if you have a blog that's got copyright information and I steal it, I'm, and I'm, I am personally liable for your copyright. Well, how about Wikipedia? Right? Do people cite Wikipedia all the time? I mean, yeah, but I don't, I, I don't I, take your copyright information and rewrite it into a narrative using other language that may be public domain or not even copyright. No, I, I understand that, but that's why I'm saying this is this is different. But there are similarities in that. Just step back for a second. It, it, is is the platform responsible for that? And I think you're arguing yes, it is in this case because the platform is actually generating the code or generating the answer as opposed to serving it. But it's still a gray area to me. It's not pretty great. It's not great to me. I mean, if I go to chat GPT and I say, you know, write me a novel about X or write me a news story and I steals your breaking analysis. That's that large language. I'll essentially strip mind your information, say it's copyright. And I think you do copyright. I'm not sure if we do or not, but let's see you did. And then I turn around and make that my ebook. You know, it, I stole your content, not knowing it was yours. I understand was, that. But so, was, but, but Apple news and Google, and in this day and age, people don't even read the articles anymore. They just scan it for the headline and that, and I get that on Google. And so it, 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 in a sense, it scrapes the, 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 the copyrighted material and they get away with it, you know, because the law protects them, but then it, it, it's, it's, it's similar in infringement on the IP and that, well, it certainly hurts their business. It hurts their, Apple, the publisher's Apple advertising Apple revenue. News, Apple news doesn't steal news. They just, it's an aggregator and it's a, like a browser news reader. And yeah, I actually, understand. But isn't that aggregation a, a, no, a form of dis, disintermediation? Right? No, Cause it, 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 what's that? It's distribution. It's distribution. Oh. At first, it was seen as distribution. Oh, wow, great. I want to get good Google results. And next thing you know, the publisher's business is in the tank because they can't make money. Look at BuzzFeed, right? Oh, wow, BuzzFeed kicking ass. They, they show up on Google search all the time. And they can't make money, right? Because you don't you need BuzzFeed. You just scan it on Google. Just read the headline. Everybody today is headline I think, readers. I think, I think you know? Buzz, the BuzzFeed just laid off 10% of their 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 company and then also on the in, oh no business insider laid off 10 percent of their company buzzfeed shut down their entire news division very iconic that had nothing to do with google it was either mismanagement and they rode the back of the social networks which, which then turned the backs on them facebook changed their algorithm they depositioned news i think facebook and that's that's more the problem apple news which you brought up i don't think is a problem at all i think that's just you know a directory service that has nothing to do with anything other than giving users, users a great experience that's got monetization behind it. They have contracts and they actually don't steal content. Um, Facebook deprioritized and then didn't compensate the BuzzFeeds of the world. We know how that works. We've seen that on Silicon Angle. So, you know, I think Buzz, BuzzFeed just overinvested. They didn't try to scale up, but that's an iconic brand that rode the wave of social media. They wanted to be the front page of social media and they were kick ass for a while, but now it's, it's, uh, it's gone to hell in a handbasket. So, you know, they're kind of trying to pivot. In, you know, in Business Insider. And the digital landscape is changing radically. So again, we're the media implosion is a sign of the times that the footprint's changing, that the user experience is changing. And I'm not sure if that's A, I don't really know what the answer is other than the fact that, you know, it's hard to be in the media business when you're either ad supported uh, or rely on traffic. All I'm saying is that there's historically the platform has not been held accountable for the impact of whether it's aggregating the results, feeding the results, promoting the results, distributing the results, uh, and 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 now it's changing because yeah. of generative AI is actually, you know, code pilots and creating results and 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 writing poetry and and that's different. But now, so again, the, historically, the platform has never been legally held accountable, and that's changing. And my my concern is that the government doesn't know how to adjudicate this stuff, 
right? It's not going to be, is it going to be self adjudicating? It's no, it's going to change. I mean, hey, this evolution. I mean, look at the government should never be involved in the platforms. I think that Facebook, when there is abuse like Facebook, the government and the market should have been more, but they had take overtook liberties. I mean, Facebook was very had malpractice as far as I'm concerned. I think that was terrible with the elections and whatnot. And they hid under the on the section for platforms that they weren't a publication. We we've, we've had that argument before. And we, I think you and I are both on the same page. They should have been reprimanded, but by the law, they could hide behind that law if it was written in the early days of the web. Right now, in terms of media implosion, platforms will change because at the end of the day, the platforms will be recreated based upon the user experience. And that's what you're seeing. And it's already happening. So I don't think the government should be involved. And I don't think platform definitions should be you know, debated at this point because they're pretty much dying, right? The only thing that's, ha that's happening is notable is the platform shifting. Look at the success of Substack. Substack has notes now. They have um, where all the best writers are going on Substack. You're starting to see a newsletter, video. So digital media and and distri the distribution of how people discover and consume will ultimately be a, driven by a platform somewhere or platforms, plural. So I just think that's changing. And a lot of investors obviously aren't high on the current platform. And certainly the market's not voting on the current platform, hence the media implosion by BuzzFeed, Business Insider. I mean, who's next? You know, there's, we had Protocol that went under. And so you, it's media is not a healthy business when the old model, that's why they're all failing, all jumping in on newsletters. Well, but, so, but, but so this is kind of my point is, is, is section 230 was when, when did that come out? Mid nineties, really before the web even was a big thing. It was and, during the telecommunications act. Okay. When was that? Uh, look it up somebody, but, but mid nineties, I think, as I recall. And so, so that, protected all the social media companies who are now putting, you know, we're seeing, they've always been putting dead tree companies out of business. You now the, the, the print publications, now they're putting all the online publications out of business. My question is, my point, I guess, is that section 230 is inappropriate for, for, for the, the today's new platforms that are AI powered. So what is going to adjudicate? And then the, you know, the answer is not to, to pause. That's stupid. You know, we talked about that. So what's going to happen? Is the government going to come up with an answer? Because they, I just, they I just never get it right. I just said it's going to happen. A new platform will emerge. I mean, 230 was written in 1996. No, I'm talking about the laws. I mean, the platform independent of the laws. What? Oh. How's that going to be played out? Anyone, right? Anyone's guess. I mean, I think this is the good question. The question is, what will be the answer? And the, the market's playing out, Dave. You're a free market guy. You talk about this all the time. Just look at the marketplace. You see what's happening. Media is imploding. We just talked about that. Elon Musk is trying to take a product that was never changed from the day it started, which became successful by accident. And he's trying to make it a real product. And he's pissing off everyone in return. But that's an interesting experiment if you look at what he's trying to do. You know, the mainstream media on a broadcast base, which NAB just happened in Vegas, you know, what's, what does broadcast even mean on, you know, on TV and what's cable, what's digital streaming services? You're seeing all kinds of people backing out of their streaming arrangements, all these uh, houses trying to figure out how to do streaming. The platforms are completely fragmented right now. Nobody actually has a clear vision on it other than it's going to be digital somehow. And if you look at the journalism side, that's a whole nother ball game. News isn't making any money. We know that for years. And there are all the best talent is going into either these subscription services like newsletters and or content programming that's going to be much more um, deeper or uh, uh, monetizable, I should say. So it's uh, uh, a media company can emerge. Obviously, we're one of them and we're at the forefront of that. I think our model is the best with video first, AI enabled. And I think you're going to start to see users figure out you know, uh, or some entrepreneurs will figure out how to create a platform or platforms to provide access to the best content. I mean, I mean hell, I'll, the, I'll, the I'll cite something. Found, the Instagram founder, uh, um, the two founders are starting a new company. Uh, they got an app that they claim is going to be AI powered news. Will that save journalism? I don't know. We'll mm. see. Mm. I, I, I could save it, could kill it. I'm going to cite something you cite all the time, Andy Grove. Let chaos reign, then reign chaos. And I am a free market person, and I, 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 the last thing I want is the government to try to figure it out. Look at look at crypto. The government's trying to trying to figure out crypto for you know a decade plus. Now they're just finally catching up to Binance, who was doing a reach around, right? And, and so they're clueless. And and so and, and so my 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 point is, I think the right thing to do is let chaos reign, then reign chaos. My concern is, does that mean somebody's going to attack the 
the electric grid with with generative models and and we're going to have chaos that's unintended chaos and that's that's what scares me but i just can't see the government appropriately certainly the u.s government appropriately figuring it out and so and if you try to put too many guardrails on it you're going to hurt u.s competitiveness that's that's not good i think you, i think you got to limit you know certain key semiconductor technologies which they're trying to do but then we see that that doesn't work so well you remember you remember during I mean, you i know you remember it during apartheid i went to south africa right after apartheid uh, was listed every company at the time ibm digital hewlett packard they all had south african arms they were just disguised as distributors right so you've seen the same thing happening now with key technologies and so i but i think that's got to be tightened up but I think it's really hard to predict right now what is going to happen. And I think what should happen is let chaos reign, then reign the chaos. But, you know, that we may regret that. Well, we'll see. I think it's going to be fun to watch. I mean, I think it's a wild west right now. Um, all I know is, is that there's not a lot of investments going into media. I think it's going to be an opportunity for entrepreneurial growth. I think AI will be absolutely a lever. So we'll see. I mean, we'll, we'll watch it. I mean, all right. Well, Dave, we got to get to the Elon Musk section because Elon Musk is having a very interesting week. Space Not a X, good week. Not a good SpaceX week. SpaceX right? blew up. Blue check Friday today for him. Everyone's getting their blue checks removed that didn't pay for it. So all the celebrities, you know, LeBron James, they're all chirping on Twitter. And it's, it's a revolt. There's a whole backlash. If you paid for it, you're, you're a dummy. And you're going to be a fraud. I'm like, I paid for it. Eat it. So there's value. Good. There's value in beyond having the blue check. The blue check is not what's interesting to me. It's the fact that you can post long form videos. You can edit. I, I, those are good features. I, I, that, yeah, uh, to me, that's it. value. I'll pay for value. I don't really give a shit about the blue check, but I do care about being able to post long form videos because I do a lot of long form. You know, I get I get blocked at two minutes, and now you have epic content at four minutes. So. Oh. And I don't really care if people don't want to watch the whole thing. If if 10% of the audience is interested in, you know, hearing what we have to say in four minutes, then I'm 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 happy to serve that audience. Yeah, and I think having your identity with a phone number is important. Right. And I think Great if point. the check mark is not there, then it's a real name thing. I think people took it as I was a celebrity. And everybody knows who knows Twitter in the early days, the suggested user list was driven by the, the blue check mark. And, and that was not a fair process. And I know specifically, like Jason Calcanis, who's very uh, obviously pro paid blue check. He's in Elon's camp. He he and I were not a lot, we're on that on list. We should have been on that list at that time. Jason Kelcanis and myself should have been on the Twitter list, um, and we weren't. Not that I have a grudge against it, but Jason felt slighted, and, he, and you know I think he more than I should have been on that list. And if you were on that list at that time, you got a million followers. Okay, now all those followers now be gone. I saw I, I saw a Twitter user I won't say their name. You know they had one point five million followers because they were on the suggested user list and got the blue check mark. They post stuff on Twitter, they get four hundred views. So obviously they have almost two million people that don't even follow them anymore. So you know what does that even tell you? So I think I think blue check is causing lots of lots of uh, lots of challenges around the old dogma of I'm an influencer and I'm a celebrity. Now th that's why the blue check mark, in my opinion, is legit because you should have a blue check mark to know you're not a bot. Okay, but the controversy around legitimacy, I saw someone that just posted, changed their name to to uh, Obama and they're like, send me money. And there was a link to a, a PayPal. It obviously wasn't Obama. OK, um, <laughs> Pope lost there. Uh, LeBron James. You know, they're, let's, uh, the list is everywhere. People are like, you know, uh, all the celebrities, Hollywood. And again, oh. Elon Musk is kind of right wing. <laughs> so all these people are having a, a conniption. Oh, my God, the blue check mark. I love Elon's crazy. I tell him to go below, you know, pound sand, in my opinion, but that's my opinion. Well, I mean, look, I don't see how you can't. I mean, I'm, a, I'm not a huge fan of Musk's politics, but I don't see how you can't admire what he's you know, trying to do. Forgetting about Twitter even for a minute, but what he's done with Tesla, he sort of changed the thinking of the auto industry, what he's doing with solar, what he's doing with SpaceX. I mean, that's pretty cool. You saw Virgin Galactic, you know, went under. So what he's doing with satellites. I mean, that's that's some good stuff. The tw thing about Twitter, to me, the biggest complaint about Twitter is it's polluted, to your point, right? It's like hateful. You know, people are like, oh, this is out of control. All these people are anonymous. And so they're hiding by, behind their anonymity. So I agree with you. Put in your phone number. Be, be validated. 
and, 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 and give people benefits to the give people benefits to uh to the benefits of being listed so better I, access to flow and better promotion if you're not verified you know screw up. i like twitter i like twitter i use twitter you know you and i talk all the time about the landing on the hudson that was the twitter moment and since then, the best place to get fast news is is Twitter. <clears throat> you got to parse through and make sure you're not looking at the fake stuff. But <clears throat> Twitter's Twitter's great. I don't see it, you know, dying. I think it it can be improved for sure. I never was a fan of the way that s s some of the the, the 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 people who tweet get thrown off Twitter. I, I'm again you know, free market, well, Twitter, Twitter free speech. Of, of, they had a lot of problems, but again, one of the problems was that they never innovated in the product, and everyone knows the product evolution has been really hard because the product came out luck, by lucky on purpose, you know, at, at the beginning. And so I like how Elon's you know checking out, but you know, his, but his week's getting bad beyond beyond Twitter, Dave. But wait, you know, just but, before you right, but but before you go there, I mean, I mean, Twitter. It it's it, it it if it's okay if it's smaller to me you know I think it's it, 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 in a way in, in media a... will never give up Twitter okay the news and media junkies are on Twitter Twitter will never die you know? no some they, of them have pulled hasn't, gonna... hasn't hasn't the hasn't NPR pulled out of Twitter or yeah, but they're anyway they're they're media organizations they don't need Twitter they go on their Twitter for promotion news gets broken on Twitter people who are reporters I'm talking about people not news organizations right the news organizations ones that are boycotting it outside of the reporters are all on it they're addicted to Twitter they need Twitter like you use Twitter the same reasons it's a way to communicate you know separate news organizations almost all journalists unless they have some personal problem with Elon Musk are on Twitter and that's not going to change now I think TikTok and these other platforms will emerge which is why I was going to segue into the next section which was you know, that Twitter can become an opportunity. We've talked about them being potential a replacement for TikTok or something else, whether that happens or not. But Elon Musk is making, he's making serious product changes, okay? Um, and that's that's at least notable to your point. And I think that's honorable. And I think that should be given, given a little bit of credit. Um, well, and, where Twitter screwed up uh, uh, is they, they screwed their developers. You know that. I mean, we were developers and they just, put it right up our you know what and they did that to everybody and so you know hopefully that will change i mean they're you know they're making changes and they're charging more because i understand why but they just screwed their developer ecosystem and so i, I think people should should step back give the new twitter <clears throat> a chance because it needed some changes and then you know then judge as to whether or not it's a better platform. I, mean, I think I think reasonable people can do that, but there people aren't reasonable today. Oh, he's right wing. He's a Trump fan. He's just, so they just, everything's negative. And the same thing, both sides. There's no, there's no voice in the middle anymore. That's my rant. <laughs> well, I got to just had a text from Brendan, um, producer, NPR and PBS. I've stopped using Twitter. Like I said, right. that's a media organization. Um, um, and that's not because of the state media designation, which I think we talked about in our last podcast. I believe that has now since been undone. So we'll, we'll I think that was what I saw the breaking this morning, that he's going to undo that uh, a little bit over the top. And I, I recall that as a gag. And I think that's going to be the case. There's no way NPR should be called a. Um, yeah, a that was stupid. Yes, NPR is legit. I mean, that's, that was the, just the, the thing I want to get your thoughts on, Dave, that I, not to make a joke of the SpaceX blowing up, but it was a, a tragedy. No one was on it, luckily, um, after a minute taking off. Um, the the PR response, they called it a rapid, unscheduled disassembly. And so what was funny has been going all around the web like, <laughs> like a, what a PR uh, response. And then I had a VC just texted. This is the new word for VCs when they explain when a company went under. The rapid, unscheduled disassembly, uh, a.k.a. it blew up. <laughs> yeah. it imploded. Before uh, it hit escape velocity. Oh my God. Rapid, <laughs> unscheduled disassembly. It sounds like my life right now. Oh my God, Jesus, such a terrible thing. But I love that word. I mean, you can, who who the hell comes up with a with a PR response like that? Only SpaceX. Well, I mean, look, having having watched the moon landing, you know, in the late 1960s, I I don't see how you can't be rooting for these organizations, whether it's Musk or Bezos. I mean, they're funding it, you know, with you know their largesse. And it's it's to me it's important, you know. Space exploration is critical, and the United States has to lead. And the only way they're going to lead, they're not, not going to lead with NASA because NASA can't get the funding that it needs. And so private entities have to lead. And it's I'm, I'm bummed that Virgin Galactic went under. I mean that sucks. So 
I mean, you know, maybe people are cheering about, you know, the implosion or the explosion. No, no, one's, or, no one's cheering. No one's cheering about SpaceX at all. I mean, I think it's more of their, 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 their. My response to that was I wanted to comment about the PR, you know, um, comment about how they described it. But yeah, no, that was that was it's epic. Definitely, definitely <laughs> people that are brought, that are not happy about it, and then no one's cheering. Uh, and the, and the moon exploration is looking great. I mean, the U.S. and international. Uh, absolutely doing explorations of the moon, right? I mean, that's absolutely going to be going on more and more that NASA's involved. So, you know, I think they're going to try to try to get more more lunar missions, right? So they 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 launched, you know, uh, the Mars concept for review two days ago. Um, NASA's actively in in the news recently on getting more action to the moon and Mars, but they're going go to the moon first. So, you know, I think space is going to have a comeback big time. So we'll see. I mean, I've always been a fan of of the moon over Mars just because it's closer and I think it's more practicable. It doesn't have an atmosphere. So I get why Mars is alluring, but, you know, the moon's right there. I mean, so go conquer it's the water. moon first. There's water on, that, on the moon as they've been discovering. So yeah, all good. All good. Um, a lot of other stuff, Dave. I mean, uh, you know, not to go back on our TikTok. We always rant on TikTok, but Montana lawmakers approve the first of its kind bill that bans TikTok and bars uh, and uh, and idiots uh, these and people are idiots bars and app stores uh, from the app starting in january so you know. uh, complete idiots i'm sorry they're just it, it's just so stupid it's so just dumb politics i, mean, I guess my, my semi rant here we kind of made this point a couple of weeks ago you know and, and dave michelle wrote about it beautifully that it's this whole conversation should start with reciprocity the mistake that lawmakers are making is they're trying to make the case against tiktok on grounds of security and privacy and it's stupid they should be making the case on economic grounds meaning they should say look if if you want tiktok to operate a chinese-based company in the u.s then u.s companies need to have the same rights in china now of course china is going to immediately dismiss that but then that's a judo move that puts china into a position of having to defend the ridiculous posture that you know, we can do it to you, but you can't do it to us. So when China rejects it, the logical next step is to say, OK, China, then ByteDance has to sell a majority ownership, just like you do in China, to a U.S. based company. And that U.S. based company will will run it and adhere to all the local laws. And and if China doesn't like it and ByteDance doesn't agree to it, then and only then can you say, OK, we're going to ban it. But jumping right to the ban is idiotic. It's 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 just it's not a smart move. The smarter move is to make the case on economic grounds, not on political grounds. It is a state. It is Montana. It's a state. So it's not like a federal thing, but still it is. It's still stupid. It's a dumb precedent. It's a sign. It is a sign of the times, I guess. That's why I wanted to bring it up, because we were just ranting on that. Our other pods. It's not smart. I mean, be smarter. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> maybe their publicity like hey we're all about fly fishing we don't want tiktok here but if that's the if that's the outcome you want take a path that's that's, who's that's they? smart who's they well obviously the people of or the state of montana i don't know if the people of montana they just they haven't thought about it people obviously well, when they, they jump they, right it's to long, Dave, this is nothing this is why i want to bring it because you, you nailed it it's the lawmakers is it the people demanding it no, definitely not. I mean, I, I don't think. I mean, it, it, certainly not the young people. I know. This is exactly my point. Lawmakers don't know what the heck they're talking about. Clearly. This is an example of press, you know, um, looking for press, lawmakers looking cool to their constituents, the big bad, you know, time-wasting app, you know, we got your back, malware, all that fear that was on uh, in Washington, D.C. around TikTok, which... I thought we commented beautifully on, frankly, but you know, they're gonna this is just classic, you know, we got your back. It's all bullshit, in my opinion. So it's I don't, you know, and, it's just nonsense. And by the way, it's not just lawmakers. It's 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 not just lawmakers. The Biden administration, Trump administration make the same stupid mistakes. Right. And this this was a this is it could be fixed. This, this they have an opportunity. This was a missed opportunity to pull a, like I call it a judo move. Your your term on China and, and make them defend their ridiculous policies. You know, early on, China had the posture of, look, we're just getting started. So we need to have 
you know, some local control. Okay, they could make that. Now that China's a world power, you know, the, who knows? They might ease up on that. That would be a great outcome for free marketers like myself, free market, you know, proponents like myself. But irrespective of that, the smart move is to put it back on them. Not And, and what, what we've done is say, okay, we're banning TikTok. Well, that's just dumb because as you say, the people don't want it. Young people certainly don't want it. The whole privacy thing is just... That's not the right way to do it. And so just be smarter about it, politicians, and just stop your bullshit. Well, on the uh, money side of the business, uh, in the enterprise, Dave, a lot going on. There seems to be a surge in the enterprise. There is uh, VC funding data that's coming out for cybersecurity startups falling, uh, fell nearly $2.7 billion in Q1, 23, down 58% year over year. From last year, obviously, the economy's changed, but security in particular, it's interesting that that's the case. Um, I found out that Lang Chains, means AI companies are all getting funded at massive valuations. So the enterprise market is still hot, um, but yet showing signs of this have and have nots on the SaaS side. So it was, we seems to be coming through to the Gen 1 cloud cost optimization Yet when I put my ear to the ground at KubeCon and talk to other practitioners and CIOs, the on-prem, you know, dogma of you know repatriation, I, I don't think is true. But there is definitely more on-premise activity in terms of cloud operations. So you got cost optimization in the cloud, but in Europe, the cloud growth seems to be real. And I'm not sure that's reported yet, but the whole sovereign cloud in Europe here is not because you know I'm in Amsterdam is is happening. So I think there's going to be growth here. And I think based on KubeCon's attendance, which was sold out by Factor of Two, is amazing. And I think, you know, Amazon in North America and Azure are all kind of hurting. I, I heard a rumor through the grapevine here uh, and other shows that Azure servers are melting on the ChatGPT stuff. So you're seeing them start to pull back. So maybe ChatGPT <laughs> did went a little too early. That's interesting. They, a couple of things. They so can't get, they can't get data center space from what I'm hearing. So Azure right now is actually trying to procure data centers. So if anyone out there is listening, owns a data center, forward this pod to them and tell them I sent you and that Microsoft's looking for data centers. I mean, look, data center has been booming, you know, digital realty, Equinix. I mean, the data center market's going to continue to boom. But I want to come back to your point on security. I was working on this for breaking analysis today. Our new journalist, David Strom, is coming on, head of uh, RSA. And I was just looking at the ETR data for the Emerging Technology Survey. This is a survey of private companies, that, of, of 1,400 IT decision makers. There are 90 plus companies that hit their survey they're just asking like which emerging companies are you working with and there's like supposedly like four thousand security companies but there's 90 that hit this survey and i'm just looking at you know where the action is in cloud security identity app security you know, intrusion i mean it's just unbelievable companies like i'll just throw some out there one password beyond trust nord security arctic wolf uh hacker uh one code 42 netscope tanium exabeam bits bit site sneak security scorecard i mean it's just on and on and on and then we saw akamai last week bought uh neosec we had talked about this on breaking analysis that api security was going to be ripe for m a and we didn't call Ak Ak akamai as the buyer but you know we called api security so i think to your point VCs have funded plenty. They got to get a return out of this. So, and they're sure they're shifting to generative AI. Why, why wouldn't you right now? Well, I want to get you, I want to ask you a question because I know you got a lot of data on your breaking analysis and, and to put a plug in for Dave's breaking analysis. If anyone doesn't get it yet, you should get it. It's called the Q breaking analysis um, where it goes into depth on the buyer side, the CIO surveys and all the trends around buyer behavior and purchasing power and the right tech. First of all, one thing I heard was, a lot of consolidation amongst um, suppliers. Again, that happens in down markets. That's normal. I'd love to get your thoughts on how real you think it is. Also, we're coming into Q1 earnings seasons. The big three are announcing soon, Dave. I think next week, or it's coming up next week, all three hyperscales, I think. Uh, AWS from Microsoft, I mean, Amazon, Azure from Microsoft, and GCP from cloud. Well, it's going to be interesting to see what their growth rates are and where they pegged their their. Um, projections were so 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 that's going to be interesting to watch but i wanted to ask you around uh buyers we heard budgets aren't shrinking but they're not expected to be accelerating are you hearing that or are you business as usual what's your take on what you're hearing in terms of the spend 
Um, I mean, right now that it, everyone's calling it cost optimization. What do you? Yeah. What's budgets are absolutely one hundred percent shrinking. There's there's no question. The data is clear. We entered. 2023 with an expectation of CIOs and IT decision makers of of, of budgets uh, growing in the high fives, 5.6, 5.7%. That's now down to mid threes, three and a half percent. Q2, which we're in right now, is down in the low twos. Okay, so no question budgets are shrinking. Anybody who says they're not is just, you know, missing the boat. Now, there are pockets of growth uh, that are above the mean. Uh, energy, no surprise. And the other is government. No, again, no surprise, uh, particularly in, in, in security. Also, this was really interesting in the data, small and mid-sized businesses are spending at a much, much higher rate than large businesses. Uh, you're talking about five to six, even 7% of, of, of growth expected this year versus the 3.5, 3.6% average. So, a, no question budgets are coming down, but there are still some some pockets of growth. And but one other point, you know, all this like repatriation mumbo jumbo, it just doesn't show up in the numbers. No question that cloud growth is moderating. I think you're going to see that this this the, when we see their earnings results next week. I expect 15 to 20 percent growth in the hyperscalers this year. But you're talking about, you know, low to mid single digit growth for all the on-prem companies. When do you think uh, acceleration is going to come back? Any any guesstimation, just ballpark? It's 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 a really hard question. And I think it's it it's it's a function of uncertainty. I've never seen uncertainty like this, John. I, I would say if if I had to guess, we're gonna see this sort of sideways move you know, up and down, maybe little pockets of growth, but I think it's going to spill into 2024. I honestly do. Uh, until this, until the it's a weird, that's a weird market. I agree with you. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of torn. Like I have this bipolar moments where on one hand, my, I'm seeing doom and gloom and I'm like uncertain. On the other hand, I'm seeing massive, not hype, but momentum. I mean, we're in Amsterdam here for the Linux foundation, cloud native Kubernetes conference, KubeCon. Dave, 10,000 people, 2,000 on the waiting list for a European event. So that's different. That means that's a steady state 2018 number. Yeah, but so listen, so this is, it's not doom and gloom. This is to your point. It, so we, as I say, we entered the, the year looking at almost 6% growth. So my point is there's pent up demand to spend. People want to spend on digital. They want to spend on technology. There's, they, they need to spend on security. It's two, two big uh, uh, sectors are security and data. People want to spend on data. So there is pent up demand. Um, and so I, I think it's they're ready to pounce. It's just they have to get the green light from the CFO and the CEO. And they're not getting it right now because earnings. So earnings are coming down. And 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 I think, you know, I think the keys is still the Fed. If, once interest rates truly peak and start to come down, uh, see, I, I do think we actually are <laughs> in a bit of a recession right now. And I think it's going to show up in the numbers. The problem is the Fed's numbers are sort of rear view mirror. So I think once interest rates start to come down, people calm down a little bit. You get a little generative AI kick in to the economy. So I would say at the earliest, I think it's going to be Q4. I think we're going to have a soft Q2. I think we're going to have a soft summer. Maybe best case, we get a rebound in Q4 if the Fed maybe doesn't loosen, but maybe they stop tightening. The market will take off. People will feel better. And then I think 2024 will be actually a pretty good year. Yeah, I mean, I think your I would agree that I feel like a lot of the startups that have been told keep your runway because obviously it's not you know it's nuclear winter that they're going to come out and they're saving their, their runway. I think there's going to be a real impact on the tech side around platforms and tooling. Meaning, um, I think a lot of SaaS companies that have been having good multiples that are either public or private will basically some of them will go out of business. I think the, the customers were going to start settling in on on platform solutions like they do in every down market. That's going to affect cash flow for some of the vulnerable start uh, growing uh, companies, public and private. Then I think that's just going to be fact. I, then I then I think what's going to happen is you're going to see this pent up spend opportunity based on the demand around okay it's okay to spend now when people feel comfortable i think the fed is kind of fucking everything up in my opinion i think they're really the, the one that's causing a lot of confusion i think once people understand where the fed is with inflation that to me will be a tell 
tell sign. Because if that happens, I think it's going to go right into cloud native, the stuff that we've been reporting on. Because again, we're seeing the activity that that I haven't seen in my entire career of 30 years in, this, in, the, in the business, in the cycles, on this early stage formation. And I've never seen it like this, this active and this legit. Now, this hype, don't get me wrong. But if that continues, that will slingshot into spend. And I think you're right on that the companies are, you know, squirreling their nuts away for the winter, right? And then release. Uh, that could happen. Now, the question is, will it happen in Q4 or Q1 next year? Yeah, I think I think you're right on. I mean, but, but I think you got to take Powell at his word. He's basically saying, I'm going to keep tightening. So until until that changes... You know, it's funny, the Fed used to not give visibility, but they put themselves in a box because they're saying, okay, now we're going to give visibility, which is fine. I don't really have a problem with that, but he's got to stick with it now. And the banking, you know, the the regional banking hit that was, uh, you know, that we saw with SVB, you know, created a little wrench in his scenario and he was forced to do a, like a half raise, or a quarter point, whatever it was. But so I think he's got to, he said he's going to keep raising. I think he's going to keep raising and it'd probably go too far and it's going to hurt the economy. And then that's going to hurt tech spending. And then, you know, we'll work through it. Hopefully the recession won't be too bad. And yeah. then, and then, then 24 will be good. I think that, like your point, there is definitely pent up demand. I mean, well, Dave, I want to, I, we don't, I want to end the last couple of minutes we got here. Uh, I'm in Amsterdam on time zone. You're, you got a busy Friday and you know, we, we cannot be able to go the whole hour. Um, but I want to get this in because I think you and I were talking about it is this chip issue, right? Guidance yeah. around, um, you know, subsidy concerns with uh, TM uh, TSMC, yeah, uh, and you got you know we're always ranting around the trade secrets, but like this is a real chip thing. Now I've been hearing that there's been a chip uh, hoarding um, market, meaning that it's going to be a massive over uh, stuffing of chips in the channel, so to speak. Um, I'm not sure if that's true or not. What are you hearing about the Taiwanese chip maker in talks with the U.S. government about its guidance for you know, the CHIPS Act designed to boost manufacturing in the United States? So a lot of this came when Pat Gelsinger was running around and you know putting on a tie and going to Washington. He did a phenomenal job uh, as an industry ambassador. And you know the $50 billion CHIPS Act is really designed to bring manufacturing back on shore to the United States because, as Gelsinger points out, you know, we used to 30 percent. Now we got 10 percent and we want to get back to whatever, 20 percent by the end of the decade. I, I don't know the exact numbers. Maybe it's 25 percent. So they're trying to lure uh, the big makers. So that's Intel, um, TSMC and and Samsung uh, are, are the big ones. And so the U.S. government has said, OK, we're going to have the taxpayers put, put in 50 billion dollars and we'll help you build these fabs. Fabs are like incredibly expensive. We're talking, you know multiple tens of billions of dollars to build a fab. So just for people who don't know, TSMC is by far the, the most advanced, the volume leader in chip manufacturing. The and, and so they do all the, you know, the five nanometer, the three nanometer, they're way ahead of the curve and they are cranking out volume. And the reason is really largely Apple, Apple sucking up tons of TSMC volume, all the, the very highest end, the 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 most advanced chips at massive volume and in the semiconductor business volume means lower cost okay i won't even go into why but volume is everything intel when pcs picked uh, peaked in the early you know 2012 time frame they lost the volume edge and that was taken over by 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 arm architectures the thing is arm doesn't make chips and most of the the company Apple, I mean, Apple designs its own chips, but it doesn't make them. TSMC makes them, and so they send the design to TSMC. TSMC uh, makes them according to the ARM spec, and they've got the volume advantage, 10x the number of wafers that come out of X, X86. Okay, why is that important? It's important because Taiwan is essentially considered as by China to be part of China, and China we're limiting their access to advanced chips, <laughs> and so. If China goes over and takes uh, takes over Taiwan and TSMC, that's a nightmare scenario. So the U.S. is saying, kind of trying to get ahead of it, bring back into the U.S. The, the, the problem is, okay, great, we got the money. Now there's the U.S. government is saying, well, here's the thing. We want a piece of the profits to go back to the taxpayers if your, if your uh, uh, revenue exceeds, your profits exceed expectations. 
Number one, if, it, if you have more cash flow than you thought. Number two, we want you to basically open your, your books. So TSMC is saying, well, wait a minute. That wasn't kind of part of the original deal. We don't know exactly what our profits are going to be. It's just a forecast. And so I kind of, on the one hand, don't blame them. On the other hand, I could see some lawmakers saying, well, wait a minute. This is U.S. taxpayer money. We're giving you all these tax breaks. We want a piece of the action. I, If I were TMC, SC, I'd say, okay, fine. Then if we... If we if we don't hit our projections, then you fill it with a buffer. And of course, that's never going to happen. So here's what I think. I think you got to let it. It's more important to have onshore manufacturing than it is to try to optimize based on, you know, future profits. If they come in and they make a lot of money, they're going to hire more people. It'll be, in, you know, indirectly, they'll get tax revenue. I think it's more important that we bring companies onshore and stop dicking around with the fine print. That's my take. Yeah. And I think what's interesting to see how fast those chips can be ramped up, you know, what the, what the right strategy is. Clearly we have to get a domestic strategy, in my opinion, but you know, I think you got to watch out the overbuying. I think the supply chain problem will be continuing to be managed. Um, uh, and I worry about people over purchasing chips just to hoard <laughs> inventory. It becomes a chip war. Anyway, Dave, great, uh, great. We got this in um, again. This is episode eight of our Cube Pod. We're trying to get a feel for it. We're feeling good about the format. We'll start bringing in guests, Cube alumni, uh, getting the top most important stories we're watching. Again, we got these are events around the Cube and, top, of course, the top news, but also the stories we're looking into. You know, we got KubeCon here. It's finishing up uh, today. We got RSA for security next week. And we just got a, a bunch of events lined up throughout the year. Big focus on security. We've got a new writer on the team. We'll be adding more editorial. We're going to start changing a little bit more on uh, what we do on location at physical events as they're back. The events are back, Dave. So um, people are starved for more uh, Cube at events. So you know, we learned, we did some experiments here at KubeCon. We did featured panels. We added more formats. We did some set pieces. So overall, the Cube at live at events is going to be evolving. And I think we're going to end up expanding more and then bringing more studio into it. We had great feedback from the community uh, here in the cloud native, cloud builder world. Um, a lot of businesses as well, a lot of executives here too. Really interesting day. So I think, you know, a lot of going on and, and, and super excited. We can have the pod here to kind of bring it all together. Yeah. So, so I just want to say, that. so RSA next week, we're going to be on broadcast row in Moscone West. Four days, the cube will be there. So by all means, stop by. Or if you can't, if you're not at the show, go to you know, cube.net. We got a big crew there. And our new writer, uh, David Strom, who's a security pro, going to come on breaking analysis today. So, I'm so excited to be working with him. So yeah, we're going to be covering that like a blanket. I'm really excited. I want that shout out to Brendan, our producer. He's just notified our booth BA-06. If anyone has the codes, one interested in where we are at Dell, at, uh, at, uh, at uh, RSA, we got Dell tech world. we got red hat summit behind it. May is going to be big. Uh, summer will be Brocken uh, super cloud on July 18th. That, that's up on Silicon angle. A lot of interest, Dave, on that. Again, just it should be a great second half of the, well, going into the second half of the year for the Cube. Uh, first half was very weird, but still strong on the content side. So let's keep it rolling. If anybody has suggestions on the pod format style, um, you know, we're going to have to deal with, you know, Dave on the road, me on the road, both on the road. Uh, we're going to have to uh, continue. Send us a note. We'd love to have your involvement. Uh, maybe call-ins, Dave. We'll, we'll, we'll have some fun. Next, yeah. uh, the first 10 will get under our belt and the next 10 we'll figure out. I think by the 20th episode, we should have a good feel for what this is going to be. Uh, but it's still fun. I just love shooting the shit with you and uh, running down. And again, Elon Musk might have a section every week if he continues <laughs> at this point. So uh, hey. I love it. And of course, hey. we love covering startups too. Thanks, John. I love, me too. Love it. We don't, we, we don't do it enough. And so I love that we're formalizing this. Fantastic. All right. Brendan, thanks, Dave. Uh, have a great uh, weekend. Thanks, you guys. Uh, safe trip.